So hi, uh, I think we get uh, 20 minutes. I'll try to quickly go through my slides. Uh, the point I'm trying to get across is very straightforward, so no need to go into details. Um, th today I'm going to be talking about uh, firmware-centric devices, and I'm uh, going to explain what I mean by that. Uh, we'll talk about NIC customizations, uh, configurability demands, and um, the complexity come with such uh, firmware-centric devices and uh, what is missing today in terms of mainstream tools um, to poke around these uh, devices and uh, configuring them according to the user needs. So um, what are firmware-centric devices? Basically, these are the modern device you use in every day. Um, they offer more functionality which means they have more hardware units, accelerators, and engines uh, inside of them. Uh, they have more processing power, uh, more capabilities um, for the user uh, to use, and they have more capacity in terms of internal storage, which means they are more configurable. They have more options um, to tweak and tune. So these are modern devices. And uh, some of these modern devices, they have ARM cores inside of them. They're not running full Linux OSs, which is just an example of how powerful and how configurable these devices are. And if we look at the early Linux, some of them actually ran Linux OSs, and uh, they have uh, MIPS cores in them, which uh, could easily run a full Linux OS. Um, so complex devices will eventually lead to uh, customization night nightmares for system administration or, or anyone who's interacting with uh, these devices. And uh, they offer basically tons of features and layers to set up and uh, customize, tweak and tune. And, uh, users basically needs to know exactly what uh, combinations of this feature uh, they need and how they can fit the use case and what is the uh, exact um, tuning they need for these features to work in harmony with each other. And most of the time, these features, they don't magically just work with each other uh, out of the box. For example, if you take a an egg, and has like an offload crypto engine, I'm very sure they will have lots of limitation running all of the crypto engines all at once, like TLS, IPsec, MaxSec. They're gonna have some limitations and the user needs to pick and choose what exact configuration they will eventually need to run with. And um, uh, the average user basically uses 20% out of the, what the NIC provides, what the NIC can offer. Yeah, which means uh, customizability and uh, configurability is required from the user. So I'll give here an example, some code statistics uh, for our Connectix devices. Uh, firmware code, basically, it's uh, today the core firmware code. I'm not talking about the whole thing. This is the core code that runs basically on every Connectix device. It's around uh, half a million lines of code and it has north of 600 uh, configurable knobs, which is crazy, but we need that. Uh, it's a big device, has lots to offer, and uh, it has a lot uh, of tunability and uh, customizability. Uh, so these devices grow about 25% in terms of code and uh, configura configuration knobs each year. So just to get an idea how much this thing is growing and uh, getting more complex uh, every year. So yeah, we get the point. These devices are highly configurable. They have lots of knobs, lots of settings uh, to work with. But don't get me wrong. Yeah, they're highly configurable. They're not as smart as you want them to be. Uh, eventually, a human interaction is required. 
you, the user needs to know how to configure and set up this device for his own demand. So that's highly recommended. The user knows what exactly to set up and how to configure the device, what exact combination of features to boot with. You don't need everything, so pick wisely what, uh, what you are going to need. And user needs to know the most efficient configuration for his use case. Um, so finding the most efficient configuration is a trial, uh, trial and error process. And uh, usually we are testing a full stack. It's not just testing this specific hardware. We're testing the hardware with a full stack and the, the, the NIC is only one single piece of the whole puzzle. Uh, standardization can go, uh, can only go so far. By standardization, I mean ETH2. Can do any, anything, uh, it can do everything that a user uh, wants uh, to do. And uh, for example, system control and ETH tool can help with tuning some TCP parameters that are software oriented. But the question is how can I tune the hardware TCP engines uh, and accelerators? And can I experiment with those? What the specific vendor has to offer in terms of optimizing this, uh, TCP or any other uh, offload uh, in this case. And this is the big question. Can I tune and tweak the hardware I'm working with for whatever use case uh, I'm trying uh, to explore? So the current solution the uh, vendors has to offer is just you know, download the specific vendor-specific toolbox and uh, gain the access for uh, the NIC, uh, the device internals. And the problem is that these tools, they come with a lots of issues and they're not easy uh, to use, obviously. And they, most of the time they will require user space access to the PCI. Uh, they will need some proprietary drivers, kernel modules, and long list of tool chain tools just uh, to set up one single flag or one single mode of operation that the uh, user is interested in. Uh, mostly these tools, proprietary tools, not welcome production. They have long turnaround cycles. If you're debugging an issue, it will take days until you have uh, some sort of um, environment that uh, is uh, usable, uh, workable and they just don't work with secure boot and secure kernels. So there's no solution there. You have, uh, from my experience, some people, they just boot into different OSs just to set up some flags and boot back to the uh, production or testing environment just to test some single flag. But there are lots of horror stories. I'm not gonna go uh, through all of them. So the whole idea here is to set up a single flag or to experiment with something, you don't need a tool chain from the vendor. Uh, which is yeah, um, the whole point of uh, this discussion. So let's discuss uh, quickly the types and knobs um, we, we need uh, to uh, have full access uh, for, to configure a device. Uh, basically, there are three types. Functionality, enable, disable, select a specific mode of operation from a, a list of uh, well-defined values. Uh, performance tuning, uh, performance values to you know set up all kinds of algorithm uh, limits and ranges that you might need and uh, experiment with, and verbosity and debuggability. Trigger some sort of monitor trace inside of the hardware, monitor that tracer, capture uh, uh, log, report it, and turn off that feature once you're done. Some of these features exist today, some of these features uh, do not, so we'll explore all of that in the next slides. Uh, you will categorize these uh, um, parameters into four categories. The first one is non-volatile, which is the usual uh, NV config that you have inside the firmware. These are static uh, parameters that are preserved across reboots. Volatile per, uh, device global firmware parameters. These are runtime parameters that you set up once and you reload the driver. Sometimes you don't need, you need to even to reload the driver for them to take effect, but you, you will lose them across reboots. The third one is 
Interesting one. I'm not going to go into much details today, uh, but it's uh, uh, interesting and it's mainly needed for um, uh, SRV and uh, virtualization environments where you need to set up configuration, specific configuration pair function. And mostly these are going to be runtime configuration. And the fourth one is brass types of feature for firmware to capture and debug and have uh, some sort of access to the hardware internals uh, to have some visibility and uh, to get some uh, uh, to have some gateway to view the internals of the device. Uh, so the upstream API today, we have something uh, that we can work with that can provide the uh, needed uh, mechanisms and uh, methods to allow all the stuff that uh, all the to allow uh, all the parameters needed and, and all the categories. Uh, basically, it's DevLink, and DevLink has uh, many subsystems that we can utilize for uh, the requirement, and we really today have something. So it's basically going to be DevLink params, DevLink health, DevLink resource, and uh, port functions. I'm going to go into details in the next slide. So let me quickly uh, run through all the categories and uh, what kind of uh, uh, utilities we have today. So for the first two categories, the non-volatile and the volatile NIC customization, uh, we already have DevLink params. Uh, DevLink params, they have uh, uh, flags for each param that can describe the parameters to be permanent, which is non-volatile, or volatile, which is driver in it or runtime. Driver in it means you have to restart the driver for this parameter to take effect. And if it's runtime, the parameter will take effect immediately. Uh, there are ways to show the parameters, and there are ways uh, combined with DivLink reload, it will uh, give you the full uh, the full requirement uh, for setting up a specific configuration. Also, uh, DevLink has a driver specific parameter mode where you can register parameter that driver specific, which is great for vendor specific optimizations. Uh, the big problem here is that it's hard to agree what, first of all, what belongs to DevLink and what is driver specific, what is not. So this is the big problem we're trying to solve. And uh, today, out of the 600 knobs that we can offer, only a few, uh, few parameters we have populated in DevLink, mainly because we, we just don't see um, how they can fit there. So that's the uh, main discussion today. Uh, for per function configuration, the, the, the main issue there, this is, uh, we're talking about virtualization convert, uh, environment, there's a chicken and egg, uh, and egg issue here. How do I set up a function that doesn't exist yet? Also, we can utilize uh, what we call DivLink port functions, which is the exact representation of these functions that are uh, going to be spawned dynamically into the system. So we um, we can utilize DevLink port function and combined with DevLink parameters, to set up these function before they are spawned and uh, populated into the system and uh, popped into a container or a VM. So uh, we will give the user the ability to customize the, this uh, function before they are um, used in the system. Uh, today it's, uh, DevLink core function subsystem is missing the DevLink parameters, but it's a simple hack to apply the DevLink parameters to that subsystem so you gain uh, a customizability that. Uh, uh, for the buggability and uh, RAS features, uh, DevLink is rich of uh, methods and mechanisms. Uh, as some examples, uh, DevLink deep pipe, which is good for. Uh, Viewing the offloading pipelines, they basically the steering uh, hierarchy inside the device. Uh, DevLink Health is a, uh, also the, a good utility to use um, to poke around uh, or to have a view on the DevLink uh, 
I'm sorry, in the device dumps and device internals and see the health of the device and uh, diagnose and dump all the device internals to uh, uh, just monitor the device health. Uh, DevLink region will dump the whole configuration space and DevLink resources uh, will control limits on uh, device specific resources. The problem is that this is the, the, does not give the full spectrum of what we need. Uh, and it's not really implemented by many drivers. Something's missing there. And the, I think the problem is that these are mainly read only knobs. Uh, you can only read whatever uh, the driver has, the driver and firmware has in that moment to offer. Uh, what we are missing is setability, uh, controlling what dumps I need to read. Uh, what kind of logs I want the uh, driver and firmware uh, to provide, what debug level firmware should be running in, which is very important uh, to have in production systems today, because if you have a report of an issue, the only way to get the uh, firmware to run in a specific uh, debug level is to have uh, these vendor-specific tools. So yes, setability is missing, and uh, this is something we can use uh, DevLink uh, parameters to utilize uh, to turn on some of these debug features dynamically. Uh, another thing I wanted to explore, but I, I didn't have much time, just an idea that I will try to explore in the near future, is having vendor extension, and which is like a more dynamic approach than just uh, uh, polluting the dev link and the kernel source with window specific stuff. Uh, this customizability and uh, high configurability issue existed before Next. Many subsystem already uh, tried to solve it. Also, we have something in ETHL that uh, tried to mitigate uh, the vendor specific stuff, mainly in dev link uh, in ETHL. Uh, EEPROM and uh, register dump. There we have specific vendor specific code that knows how to parse the vendor specific registers. But again, you can only read, you cannot set. You cannot set exactly what kind of dumps, what kind of registers you want to read. Uh, a good example in VME CLI. They solve the issue. They have firmware objects. They can read, log, activate firmware uh, flags and uh, read, read vendor-specific uh, uh, attributes by uh, allowing vendor extensions and plugins. So basically, uh, the, NVMe, um, uh, the NVMe stack allows the vendor to have their own extensions to the, uh, the control layer to provide their own control uh, mechanisms to set up, configure their hardware. Kubernetes and uh, they have the CNI uh, plugins that vendors can vendors and users can provide to configure the network. OpenStack has something similar, and I remember LibVirt from back uh, in the day. They also have something that uh, vendors can just plug in, and you can configure a device before it's attached to a virtual machine. So this is not something new. This is something already solved, and somehow in the native layer we still struggling. So just to summarize, um, uh, NIC attestation is still immature, even with all the div link, um, even with all the div link stuff we talked about, more work needs to be done, mainly adding more knobs and suitability, allowing the device to be uh, more configurable in terms of adding more uh, layers of parameters, uh, more vendor-specific stuff uh, to cook with, uh, to work with, and to experiment with. And the issue here is that we need to decide uh, what are DevLink parameters and what's the purpose of them. So we can finally uh, lift the embargo on them. By the embargo, I mean the uh, maintainers shooting down every single patch that's trying to add the vendor-specific parameter. So, and it's, uh, to me, it feels like there's a wonderland that we're not really utilizing here. So, 
Overall, I talked to many people, many, many customers, developers, testers, uh, uh, all kinds of people from all trades, and they all agree they need this. You can't just uh, teach people how to download all the vendors' uh, specific tools and how to use them. It's a lot of work just to set up a single flag. So we need this, uh, let people experiment with the hardware first, then we can figure out what is the standard. And once we come up with a standard, we can delete all these vendor specific flags and uh, have the standard. But before that, we must allow vendors to have uh, vendor specific flags. Questions? Questions, comments, back. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, do you have any examples of where of uh, vendor extensions where the extension was added in NetDev and then we turned it into a common interface? Extension, no, but we tried to add many uh, vendor specific parameters that got shut down. Uh, reasons are, hey, this looks more like gonna be gonna fit more vendors. So let's figure out how to do it in a standard way and just got lost between. You know. Well, yeah, I mean, some of the things that you had on the slide went in not that long ago. So yeah, it's not like we shut down everything, but the problem I see with it is the vendor adds something and then like we don't even have a good description of what the feature actually does. And then the next vendor comes in, the first one already does not care to talk even to us. <laughs> because the feature is in, right? Nobody cares. And then the second one comes in with a similar feature and like, there is no way for us to align. Yeah. Right? Like we don't all work together on the APIs. It's like different vendors pop True, up with if, the- If no one wants to align, what, what's the point? Sorry? If, one, if no one wants to align, what's the point? Right, like but we need to find is, a way to align. I have 600 parameters. I can align only with 10, but what happens with the rest of the 15, uh, 590? That's fine, as long as we can align on the 10, right? My point is that we don't seem to align even on the 10. Yeah, uh, that's the point. We can't align on everything. We need to solve that before solving the alignment. I, I need no. some way to access my hardware before I start wor working on standards. Well, because, because without that, I cannot define what the standard is. We need a path to the standard too, right? So we started working in the OCP specification. Yeah. That's a way forward in my Yeah, opinion. but this is like years and I'm losing here people that can experiment with my hardware today, which is the point of the whole talk. I want to experiment today for the to define the future standard. And I have many examples. Right. Yeah. For example, hardware GRO, right? It's still not defined the whole standard. Yeah. It's on and off feature, but we have a list of parameters just to tune the hardware GRO. And it's a standard, standard feature, right? So it will take months or years to push these parameters where today I need to uh, experiment with the hardware GRO to know exactly how to tune that. Right, but the timeout is parameter. a simple one, right? Like you can add that, no one will complain. Just not a dev link parameter. But yeah, but the hardware engine is, it's not just timeout. There are many parameters you can set up. Are you willing to disclose how the thing works so we can understand it? No, no, but I'm willing to, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to expose some of these parameters for you to experiment with, to know exactly what TCP uh, parameters to set up for Harvard GL to work exactly the way you want it. I think it is a tricky ledge here. You have to allow vendors to differentiate their hardware. There's a reason why all these different vendors keep popping up saying, I think I can do this feature better. I think I can do this market better. And that's where they get in their way of doing something that they think is a better way to do it. So take the GRO or LRO example. We can agree that LRO is a standard hardware feature, but every platform may decide, every, every NIC may decide a different way that it's gonna do LRO, right? And if a vendor wants to expose parameters for a customer to be out of tune, well, those are gonna be very unique to a customer. I mean, to, to a vendor, right? So I would love to see the vendor unique tools go away. Like the number of hours I have wasted flipping ConnectX hardware from InfiniBand to Ethernet, <laughs> that 
that alone yeah. would be more than worth it, right? I mean, that's better run a dev link command that says, no, 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 you default to infinite band, but I'm an Ethernet guy. So let's flip this thing to Ethernet, right? So if we want the vendor tools to go away, we have to allow vendor flexibility in commands. And DevLink is one, one way to make that happen. Yep. Um, I believe that Jacob had a presentation earlier in this track about YAML and the self-describing NetLink. Have we considered possibly using this for the driver, where the driver can simply register a NetLink BTF type that's exposed to user space, and then we can say something like NetLink vendor parameter change, and it's all self-describing in usable. Yeah, but still, this will require some channel inside dev, dev link that would allow. Right. So it seemed to me like the dev link parameters is an open interface where yeah. the drivers can say, here's the set of parameters I support. So it's kind of like what you're asking for, but it already exists in this notion. Yeah. Drivers get to tell through dev link what it has for knobs and a description of that. Question over there. Advantage of having DevLink is uh, also DevLink provides a standard way of checking things. Like, for example, there are some misconfiguration that we don't want to allow. We don't want to expose it to the user, so he will find it in very hard way. Uh, what feature A doesn't work with feature B, so that we can prevent it in driver. Also, DevLink provides a security model, which we don't want to lose. Something, some features are allowed only for user, some features are allowed only for as an administrator to configure. Yeah, DevLink right. is the closest to the hardware, so it makes sense to use DevLink to control I, the hardware. I, I don't disagree, and I understand why vendors need a way to um, innovate, for lack of a better word. Um, the, no, differentiate. I, I think I'll give you that, that much. Innovate. All right. Yeah, that's exactly. But I don't know who's representing the user, right? Because um, in the world where the vendors provide APIs, the user is stuck with user, a single vendor. You'll be surprised. Many production users have no issue using that. I understand that, but like there's there's a risk of a vendor lock-in, right? Because I have not seen the use the vendors coming back to standardize the interface later, and then like we don't want to just let the vendors run and lock in the users because then what's the point of the net dev? configuration interface if everybody does their own thing. So you're saying no other vendors is complaining? I don't get it. No, I'm saying the, the vendors do not seem to be aligning on anything. So if, if you so, so everybody- So we're aligned on, okay, have the flexibility to put whatever you need to configure your hardware. Or we're talking about parameters that would directly access the hardware. I'm not talking about parameters that will set up some sort of weird driver stuff. So these parameters will go exactly Directly to the hardware to set up something. You know, the, you, you say hardware, but it is firmware. So let's use it's the firmware. Let's so, use yeah, something. It's a firmware yeah. device. So yes. Yeah. So I think we all agree on that. I, I, I don't see any other vendors here today, but I'm sure we all agree on that. Um, we agree, no? <laughs> yeah. I agree. Yeah. So that we, we agree on that. We need some flexibility, and I think DevLink is the right platform. Yeah, I mean, the params exist, right? And occasionally you're allowed to use them, so. <laughs> yeah, but you're the problem, it's not DevLink. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we'll see, I'll prepare an RFC patch and. Uh, For what? I mean, you, you gave an I'm example gonna, of I'm gonna, zero hard, I'm gonna push as many zero. parameters as I need. That's, uh, okay, and we can look through them and decide which of them, like, don't but how can fun. you decide which of them are standard? Exactly. How do we you decide? Can't. That's the point. We you have can't. to get the vendors together to decide it. You can't. We have 600, they have 500. Well, one way to do it is to keep it out of the tree until there is a user with multiple see, that's, hardware that's, versions. That's a problem. That that, that's a problem for you. Tool. That's not the problem for the user. No, it's for the user. It very much is a user problem. Yeah, if if you have to, to get latest and greatest or some feature that won't get accepted upstream, I have to go to Mellanox's website or NVIDIA's website and download an out of tree MLX5 driver. That is a problem. That is a user hassle. Yeah. So you're doing the point, you're doing the job of upstreaming as much as you can. But then when a maintainer says, absolutely not on this, 
you go and do an out of tree way of doing it and you may tell your customers, hey, go download my latest driver from this website because this feature is out of tree, right? So if you want things to be standardized in tree, you have to allow that vendor, vendor differentiation and innovation sides of it, right? They do go hand in hand. There is going to be differences between vendors. Question over there. I, I, Saeed brought up the NVMe world, which I think has been pretty successful here. They have NVMe CLI and has like vendor plugins for like Samsung drives or Intel drives or everything else. And they have a pretty robust process where the, the vendors and the users, they feel like they want to standardize something. They go to the NVMe technical working group and they, they make a standard and it gets standardized and it comes out, it's standardized NVMe CLI. And I, I don't see that in the networking space very, very good. I think the OCP program is like really like could potentially grow into that. But like the users do have to push as a user, like the user has to come to the discussion and say, I want this as a multi-vendor standard. I, I want this to be common. And they need to force, they need to force the vendors to do it. And I am not convinced it's the maintainer's role to act as a proxy for the users because there's a lot of users and you know, you know your users, but there's lots and lots of other users out there too. So I think it's very hard for the community to make a decision. Like all of all of these, say six hundred parameters, you go one by one by one. Like you're never going to choose. It's it's all or nothing in my opinion. Yeah. All or one nothing. there's nothing. That's nothing. Sorry. In that case, that it's nothing. <laughs> that's my uh, vote, right? Like I, I, everybody agrees. It's everything. It's just you. Uh, we have a question. Last question, and uh, maybe we can take the rest offline. Right. One question over there. Hi, so to, just a comment. I'm the S390 maintainer, and I know S390 mainframes are different, but we actually do have an issue with that with our customers, I guess. So I would really um, advocate also that yeah. the, the vendors get a way to do, because out of stack uh, maintenance in the enterprise world, that's just a no go. Uh, yeah. If it's not upstream, uh, our users don't have it. And we do need special features uh, for our machines. And if we cannot, we cannot provide the tools to make use of the features uh, of these cards uh, if we have no upstream way to access them. Exactly. So it's, we're in a deadlock that the hardware provides features that we cannot offer to, to the users. And I like this idea of self-describing I don't know, we, we had to talk about YAML, we had to talk here about uh, BTF and BPF, where you have always these self-describing structures. Yeah, the Couldn't you have a, a general endless. way to say something here, type, size, something, push it down? Yeah, the options are endless. Endless, we just need to agree uh, something feasible or not. Why is it too much to ask for at least two users? That's standard in the Linux kernel, right? Two if users? you want to add an interface, you get two users to agree and then oh, add the We have the interface and we have two users. But you, don't, you guys don't want to talk to each other talk for some reason. The, yeah, the name of the parameter, which we cannot agree on and we will never agree on. It's a vendor specific. Okay, so we'll take the... Wonderful thing about standards is that there's so many to choose from. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Okay, thanks. Right. Thank you very much.